Hello, Americans. This program is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. I was standing out in final assembly on B-38 Lightnings over at one of the plants Saturday talking to some mechanics when the public address system was switched on. This is what we heard. Attention. The following news has just come in over the press wires. In a sweep over North Africa, Lockheed B-38 Lightnings brought down 40 Axis planes. All our planes returned safely to their bases. <laughs> For a minute, the Lockheed plant sounded like New Year's Eve, and then everybody went back to work. Good news like that about our fighting planes means a lot to all of us. The P-38 Lightning is something to cheer about, so is the Ventura bomber we make at Vega, and the four-engined B-17F. Those planes are writing history in the sky. Behind them is more than history, a tradition of nerve and know-how, of courage and patience and imagination. Behind them, behind all great planes, is the story of aviation. This broadcast, Sealing Unlimited, is dedicated to one of aviation's pioneers who's fighting in North Africa tonight. In the old days, he flew the mail there, opened the route between Toulouse and Casablanca. <laughs> Guillaume, old friend, of you I shall say a few words. That time you were lost over the Grand Atlas. We learned you'd been gone a week. It was winter. I'd come up from farthest to Mise Mise to join Daly at Casablanca. For five days, the two of us, each in his plane, had ransacked the mountains. Two ships. It seemed to us that a hundred squadrons navigating for a hundred years would not have been enough to explore that North African range. We'd lost all hope. The very Berbers themselves, bandits who'd commit a crime for five francs, refused to form a rescue party out of fear of those mountains. We should surely die. The forbidden Atlas never give up a man in winter. And when a second time I slipped between the towering walls and giant pillars of the Atlas, it seemed to me I was no longer seeking, but was now sitting up with your body in the silence of a cathedral of snow. You'd been gone a week, I say. But I was lunching between flights in a restaurant in Marrakesh. But a man stuck his head in the door and called out, They found Giamme. All the strangers in the restaurant embraced. I remember we found you, we cried like fools. Put our arms about a living Guillaume. Resuscitated. The author of his own miracle. And it was at that moment that you pronounced your first intelligible sentence. I swear, I swear that what I went through, no animal would have gone through. Frozen memories. It was hard for you to thaw them out. But there in that hotel room in Marrakesh, slowly, word by word, moment by moment, you told us the story. A storm. A storm had bottled up all space and sent every other male pilot back to his starting point. But you'd taken off in the hope of finding a rift in the sky. You found this rift, this trap. A little to the south. 15,000 Now about 15,000 feet, the ceiling being a couple of thousand feet below you and pierced only by the highest peaks, you set your course for Dakar. Down currents. Down currents. The engines run on, but the ship seems to be sinking. You jockey to hold your altitude. The ship loses speed and goes mushy, and still you the sink. The sky seems to be coming The whole sky down. seems to be coming down on you. You can't land anywhere, and you try in vain to turn around and fly back, back into those zones where the air is dense and solid as a pillar has held you up. That pillar has melted away. Everything here is rotten, and you slither about in a sort of universal decomposition while the cloud bank rises apathetically, reaches your level, and swallows you up. You almost had me in a corner once, you explained. Almost had me in a corner once. As soon as I felt I was caught, I dropped the controls, and I grabbed my seat for fear of being flung out of the ship. The wind rolled me over and over like a hat in a road from 18,000 feet down to 10. Then I caught a glimpse of a dark horizontal blot that helped me right the ship. It was a lake. I flew around that lake almost two hours till I ran out of fuel, and I set the ship down in the snow. She went over on her nose. When I dragged myself clear of her, I stood up, and the wind knocked me down. I stood up again. Went over a second time. So I crawled into the cockpit and dug me out of shelter in the snow. 
Remember, I pulled a lot of mail sacks around me, and I lay there for two days and two nights. And the storm blew over, and I started to walk my way out. I walked for five days and four nights. And you know what amazed me? Drink, old fellow. Drink. Oh, I must tell you this. After two or three or four days of tramping, all you think about is sleep. I would long for it, and I'd say to myself, if my wife still believes I'm alive, she must believe that I'm on my feet. The boys all think that I'm on my feet. As early as the second day, you know, the hardest job I had was to force myself not to think. The pain was too much, and I was really up against it too hard. I had to forget that, or I shouldn't have had the heart to go on walking, but I didn't seem to be able to control my mind. I kept working like a turbine. Still, I could more or less choose what I was to think about. I tried to stick to some films I had seen, a book that I'd read, but the film and the book would go through my mind like lightning. I'd be back where I was in the snow, and it never failed. So I would think about other things. I had to stop every two or three hours to cut my shoes open a bit more and massage my feet. They were swollen. Maybe my heart would be going too fast. I was beginning to lose my memory. Every time I stopped, I forgot something. The first time, it was a glove. And it was cold. I had to put it down in front of me, and I'd forgotten to pick it up. Next time, it was my watch and my knife. Then my compass. Each time I stopped, I stripped myself of something that I needed. I was becoming my own enemy. I can't tell you how it hurt me when I found that out. I was crawling along the side of a sheer wall, hanging over space, digging, kicking out pockets in the ice so that I could... so that I could hold on. All of a sudden, my heart conked, hesitated, started up again beat crazily, and I said to myself, if it hesitates a moment too long, I drop. I stayed still and listened to myself. And I think that never in my life have I listened as carefully to a motor as I listened to my heart, me hanging there. I said to it, come on, old boy, go to work. Try beating a little. That's good stuff my heart is made of. It hesitated. But it went on. You don't know how proud I was of that heart. There was one time, however, when you slipped and finding yourself stretched flat on your face in the snow, you threw in your hand. You were like a boxer emptied of all passion by a single blow, lying and listening to the seconds drop one by one into a distant universe until the tenth second fell. There was no appeal. All that you had to do in the world to find peace was to shut your eyes. So little was needed to blot out that world of crags and ice and snow. Let drop those miraculous eyelids, and there was an end of blows, of stumbling falls, of torn muscles and burning ice, of that burden of life you were dragging along like a worn-out ox, a weight heavier than any wain or cart, and your body that beast now gorged with suffering, lay ready to participate in the indifference of marble. Your very scruples subsided. Guillaume, you miser, you'd made up your mind to deny us your return, to take your pleasure selfishly without us among your white angels in the snows. And then remorse floated up from the depths of your consciousness. I thought of my wife. She wouldn't have any money if she couldn't collect the insurance. When a man vanishes in France, his legal death is postponed for four years. This awful detail was enough to blot out the other visions. You were lying face downward on a bed of snow that covered a steep mountain slope. With the coming of summer, your body would be washed with this slush down into one of the thousand crevasses of the Atlas. You knew that. But you also knew that some 50 yards away, a rock was jutting up out of the snow. I thought if I get up, I may be able to reach it. If I can prop myself against the rock, they'll find me there next summer. Once you were on your feet again, 
You tramp two nights and three days. What saves a man is to take a step and another step. It's always the same step, but you have to take it. I swear that what I went through, no animal would have gone through. That sentence, the noblest ever spoken, defines man's place in the universe. There's a tendency to class such men as you with bullfighters and gamblers. People extol your contempt for death. No, Guillaume, I would not give a fig for anybody's contempt for death if its roots are not sunk deep in an acceptance of responsibility. I once knew a young suicide. I can't remember what disappointment and love it was which induced him to send a bullet carefully into his heart. But I remember having felt on learning of this sorry show an impression not of nobility, but of lack of dignity. So, behind that attractive face, beneath that skull which should have been a treasure chest, there had been nothing, nothing at all. And when I heard of this meager destiny, I remembered the death of a man. He was a gardener, and he was speaking on his deathbed. You know, I, I used to sweat sometimes when I was digging. My rheumatism would pull at my leg and I would damn myself for a slave. And now, do you know, I'd like to spade and spade. It's beautiful work. A man is free when he's using a spade. Besides, Who's going to prune my trees when I'm gone? That man was bound by ties of love to all cultivable land and to all the trees of the earth. Like you, old friend, he battled against death in the name of his creation. He was a man of courage, of responsibility. You knew that you were responsible for yourself, for the males, for your family, for the fulfillment of the hopes of your comrades, for aviation itself. You held in your hands their sorrow and their joy. You were responsible for that new element which the living were constructing and in which you were a participant. To be a man is precisely to be responsible it is to feel shame at the sight of what seems to be unmerited misery. It is to take pride in a victory won by one's comrades. It is to feel, when setting one stone, that one is contributing to the building of the world. Of such stuff are the pioneers of aviation made. broadcast tonight was based on one of the great classics of aviation, Wind, Sand, and Stars by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. It was our very great privilege to have with us in the role of Guillaume, Lieutenant Burgess Meredith of the Flying Training Command. Good night, Americans. <laughs> This program was presented by the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.